Welcome to Acton Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. If we face America's racial history squarely, must we conclude that the American project is a failure? Conversely, if we think the American project is a worthy endeavor, do we have to lie about its past? In this episode, Dan Churchwell, Acton's Director of Program Outreach, sits with Rachel Ferguson, economic philosopher at Concordia University, Chicago, to discuss her new book, Black Liberation Through the Marketplace. Exhausted by extremism on both left and right, a majority of Americans, black and white, still love this country and want to do right by all its citizens. In her book, Rachel Ferguson leaves readers with a better understanding of black history and creative ideas for how to make this nation one that truly enjoys liberty and justice for all. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. My name is Dan Churchwell, Director of Program Outreach here at the Acton Institute, and I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Rachel Ferguson today. She's an Assistant Dean of Concordia University Chicago's College of Business and the Director of their Free Enterprise Center, which serves as a hub for the study and practice of the American free enterprise system. She gets to work with uh, students to learn constitutional law and the benefits of free markets, and, is un- and it's unique in its focus on the virtues necessary for citizens in a free society and on the economic wisdom needed in public policy and effective philanthropy. Prior her, uh, to her position at Concordia, Dr. Ferguson served as the professor of managerial philosophy and director of the Liberty and Ethics Center at Lindenwood University, where she was instrumental in securing millions of dollars in grant funding for educationally focused, liberty-oriented topics. Dr. Ferguson is actively involved in her own community, where she's a board member for the Freedom Center of Missouri, a nonprofit, nonprofit civil rights litigation firm that focuses on economic freedom and government transparency as well as Love the Lou, a neighborhood stabilization ministry. Dr. Ferguson earned her BA in philosophy from Lindenwood and her PhD in philosophy from St. Louis University. And today we have the pleasure of talking about her brand new book, which is available for pre-order on Amazon. It will be out in May of 2022 on the topic of black liberation through the marketplace. Welcome, Dr. Ferguson. Hey, hey, hey. Glad you're here. here. (laughs) So glad. Um... And uh, th- this book is really fascinating study. Thank you for sharing some of the early copies with me. Um, tell me about the genesis of the book. I mean, what what led you to write on this topic at the, at this moment? Well, I've been th- you know I've been thinking about classical liberalism all my life, and um, after Ferguson, after the unrest occurred in Ferguson, I got sort of involved with a lot of criminal justice reform efforts, and then the Smithsonian. Uh, the Museum for American African American Culture and History opened, and I was asked to get students down there. And I said, you know what? If I'm going to take a bus full of students down to this museum, I want to give them a different perspective on the black experience in America. And I want to show them how much of the oppression that black people have experienced in our history has been anti-liberal in the sense of violations of their property rights, their contract rights, the their right to equal protection of the law, um, and so forth. And so I put together these, you know, these lectures, and it just sort of snowballed from there. Um, so it was a very organic process. That's great. And, and in the very beginning, I, I think I got the sense of that. In, in the very beginning of the book, you mentioned this idea of bundling. And it's a, a phenomenon that is uh, troublesome when thinking about, you know, some of our modern social and political issues. What, what do you mean by this idea of bundling? Well, I just think there's a temptation to put things together that don't necessarily go together. So that's why I use the term bundling. And what I'm saying is, you know, when, when you form, say, a political platform, you know, you have to you have to include all kinds of stuff. They, they don't necessarily all follow from the same principles, right? And so I might have a position on, you know, how we should be involved in Afghanistan, uh, a position on, you know, abortion, a, a position on the environment, you know, all of these different positions. It's weird in a way that I can guess what your position will be on one thing, 
by telling you what it is on another because they're not really related, Mm. right? So why should you know what I think about climate change if I tell you what I think about abortion? And yet we've bundled into these parties, right? And the problem with that is that we're not taking the questions one at a time. Sometimes what one party holds on one issue may be right and what another party holds on the other issue may be right, or they could both be wrong, which is mostly the case. (laughs) Absolutely. Right? And so what we have to do then is sort of be determined to kind of fight that inner tribalism that makes us want to be like fully part of a group. And it's really hard to do because it actually like hits our amygdalas, you know, it's like the serotonin or whatever. (laughs) Like I'm, my group is great, you know, but you kind of have to break off and say, um, you know, I'm different on that issue. Mm -hmm. Right. And just take, take the questions one at a time. Yeah. Uh, to paraphrase Aristotle, uh, yeah, thinking about ideas without accepting them or engaging in ideas sure. and, and trying to um, not be monolithic, you know, all conservatives, all liberal or, or whatever we're talking about. Um, I appreciated that you starting out with that idea. And, and the phrase that I want to sort of introduce into the lexicon is being countercultural without being reactionary. Mm. And that's that's the issue is we're bouncing back and forth between reactionaryisms. Yeah. And what we really need is for somebody to to – plow th- a third way, right, through the middle and not th- not necessarily in the middle, right, but just but just other takes on these questions. And a lot of that, I mean, in, in my experience, is just slowing down and listening. I mean, a lot of times it's just yes. listening to other people when you, when you get down to the nitty gritty of it and, and trying to understand a person or their their positions on things. We, we don't – we're so fast and reactionary, like you said. It's Our, our media is very, uh, very quick yes. to make judgments. So um, – and another fascinating for me is is that you frame the book through the ideas of classical liberalism and the black experience. So th- this it's a very um, interesting combination. What what do you mean um, in this context, black experience and classical liberalism? Yeah, I mean, there's two ways you could take it. So, and they're both they're both applicable here. So one way is classical liberal scholars have actually done a lot on race and discrimination. Um, People don't necessarily know that Mm -hmm. or associate that kind of work with classical liberals, but there's a ton of it. And so I wanted to get it all together into one place and apply it. But what I found out on the way is that there's actually a pretty strong pro-black classical liberal tradition. And so you have not only black classical liberals like Frederick Douglass, like Zora Neale Hurston, like T.R.M. Howard, but you also have white allies that are classical liberals like two of the founders of the NAACP. Um, And so, you know, you've got Rose Wilder Lane writing for the Pittsburgh Courier, which is the biggest black newspaper in the country. And she's arguing for black liberation from the perspective of Mm self-ownership, private property rights, freedom of contract rights, and equal protection of the law. And that was actually really refreshing to discover. And she was Laura Ingle Wilder's daughter. That's right. Right, right? And some people think she helped her a little bit with the books (laughs) because she was a good writer. (laughs) Yeah. Love it. Um, so, so for those who are listening, that might uh, a lot of our listeners will be um, that, that have the the understanding of what when we say classical liberalism. Can you just give us a quick what what is classical liberalism? Yeah, in, in sure. That? I mean, I think what you see is you know, look if you look at ancient societies, they're small, they're homogeneous, right? And everybody's the same religion. Everybody, you know, and so what you see arising in the 18th century is a tradition that is facing the fact that we are now in more ideologically and religiously diverse communities. We're going to have to get along in peace. And so there's a a kind of tolerance that comes with liberalism. Uh, I'm using the term liberalism in the classical sense here, not the American sense. And, uh, And with that, people like Adam Smith, right, are beginning to discover that regular Joe Schmo people are getting richer and they're they're wondering why, right? Mm-hmm. And they're realizing that free trade is incredibly productive. And what is free trade grounded in? Property rights. I've got to be able to own something so that I can exchange it, so that I can use it productively, so that I can be cre- a creative entrepreneur. I have to be able to make all kinds of contracts, et cetera. And so you start to get these values kind of congealing, right, a- about property rights and freedom of contract and the idea that the state really needs to be – it can't be making citizens good. That That's fine if you're in Athens, you know, 
uh, when Aristotle is writing with 150,000 people. That doesn't work, right, for, for the country of England or something or 330 million Americans. Certainly not, you know. And so the state has to be very limited in what it gets into. Um, and actually, Adam Smith was – really critical of the way that business people would would collude with the state, you know, in order to shut out competitors and things like that. That was sort of his class analysis, if you want to call it that. And so, um, you know, so you have all these sort of elements of kind of this public choice theory analysis of our relationship with the state, the minimal state, certain basic institutions. But then on top of all that, and this is the key, is understanding that business and entrepreneurship is a great gift to mankind, sure. right? And telling a beautiful story about business. Yeah. And, and so the, the combination of this book and th these two topics is what I find fascinating because a lot of – if you read – especially modern commentary, but even, I mean, just historical knowledge. Um, it seems like classical liberalism was good for a certain class of people, but not good for another, or at least that's the the c concept that's portrayed. Right. And so when you talk about this idea of classical liberalism, it seems like it largely failed the black community. And, and, and so uh, how do you deal with that tension? Oh, my goodness. What a great way of putting it. Yeah. I mean, if you look at somebody like Karl Marx, he's he's reading Locke and thinking, hey, Locke's just a middle class guy who wants to keep his property safe from the king. Right. And so he's got a very <laughs> cynical kind of reading there. And and I think that that reading sort of persists, especially when we see the failure um, of our institutions to protect black people. And so what I, I think the only defense I can really give is to say, you know, we've only been at this for about 250 years. The first liberal societies that emerged weren't going to totally overcome ethnic hatreds and, you know, some of these leftovers from the pre-Enlightenment world. And so we foundered on the shoals of our of our racism and our willingness to exclude certain people. But the concept of liberalism is always – of true liberalism – is always to extend those freedoms as far as they can go, right? And so you're adding women and you're adding blacks and you're adding immigrants and – right? And you're, and you're constantly trying to make it totally neutral between citizens. Yeah, because that – I mean it's obviously a, a, a tension-filled period. Um, but at, at Acton, we like to think about the intersection of faith, work, and economics and this the engagement between the marketplace the, um, with religious institutions. And you you write heavily in uh, in your book about the black church as part of this story, how integral the black church as culture builders. Um, can you tell us – because a, a lot of people might not be unfamiliar with that part. Yeah, that's right. As a matter of fact, I remember the day I called my co-author and I said, we're going to need a chapter on the black church. That was actually added. And the reason was because it was becoming obvious in my research that – I mean, for one thing – w one of the things about classical liberals that I maybe didn't mention before is that when you have a minimal state – and you have a, a flourishing market. The other thing you absolutely must cultivate is a flourishing civil society, mm -hmm. right? And so that can get lost because it's decentralized. And so we don't often like write books on that, right? So we write books on the state and we write books on the market. But what happens to civil society? And I thought, you can't tell the story of black people in America without having a chapter on the black church. That's insane. The black church is the cultural womb of black America. Mm -hmm. And it was the source of so much hope that they could be free one day and that they could participate in the American dream. And that was really the narrative until very recently. And so, you know, when we have maybe a more hopeless kind of narrative that's come about more recently. But the the black church is such a stunning institution. And because it was the only place where black people really had a lot of autonomy – because white people ignored them there, um, they could form all sorts of social networks, business networks, um, the greatest leap forward in liter literacy in the history of mankind thus far was accomplished by the black church. Hmm. That's how you got to majority black literacy by 1910. That is amazing, Absolutely. right? And it's because why? They wanted people to read the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and you you hear a lot about um, at least it's becoming more known, and I think one of the positive outcomes of a lot of the 
the terrible things that have happened in the last uh, seven, eight years with um, some of the racial tensions in America is at least there's more history coming out yeah. and, and some conversations around some of these topics. Um, more people are willing to have the conversations. But you, you talk about places like Black Wall Street or, or Tulsa, Oklahoma and some of the thriving black uh, middle class. Yeah. And you, you mentioned in a, in a different context that um, today 80 percent of African-Americans are, are, are not in poverty. That's right. right. And and so I think there's a lot of media. I mean, if you look at photography and marketing pieces, it, it, it gives the sense that, that that just doesn't correspond to reality. And and I think your book does a great service in showing how the uh, the black middle class has always been strong and, and the ability um, – you know, these civil associations, you argue, were pivotal to the health of these black communities. Can, can you describe some of the types of organizations that existed historically that provided these uh, economic improvements, networking and mentorship to the communities? I mean, yeah, you, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, the sort of the most famous, um, well, maybe among classical liberals, I don't know how well they're known outside of it, but the fraternal associations, right? So you have, and David Beto is the historian who really wrote the book on a lot of these fraternal associations, but there are other books on them as well. You have literally over half of black men in the early 20th century, a member of one of these types of fraternal Hmm. associations. And these associations were um, kind of like having insurance, except that you weren't pulled according to risk. You were just a member because you were. And back then, insurance meant something like Um, If you died, helping your wife pay for the funeral or if you got sick, helping your family get through until you could work again. And but of course, here's the thing. That's the core purpose of them. Right. But like any civil society institution, they get um, concentric circles, right, radiating out. In other words, you end up serving all these other purposes organically. And the kind of networking, things like, hey, I know you. I'll give you a no interest loan because I believe in your business plan. Those sorts of things happen naturally. What happens when you bring in something like Social Security where now the core reason for the existence of the association goes away, you also lose all of the secondary benefits of the association, right? And so um, those still – there is still a, a large participation of, of black men in these types of things, but much weaker, of course, than it was at that time. Um, those sorts of associations were just absolutely huge. The church itself – I mean, if you watch the um, Netflix series on Madam C.J. Walker, you mm-hmm. know, and her hair care – Company. She was the next door neighbor to Henry Ford. I mean, she was a millionaire. Absolutely so successful and 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 uh, created success for many other people through her saleswomen. Um, you know, she um, would kind of announce things in church, right? And then the competitor, there's even a funny scene where they're like competitively announcing their, <laughs> their business in church. And so so those sorts of places that were sort of black only kind of um, spaces. There was a lot of really productive stuff that happened there. And then, of course, Booker T. Washington with his whole concept of self-help, which doesn't mean pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Hmm. It means the black community helping each other, right? He put such an emphasis on gaining property, gaining skills, and starting businesses. You can really give Washington a ton of credit for the establishment of a black middle class, And these are the people who funded the civil rights movement, right? Right. And so we can't just forget about them or think of them as dirty capitalists. That's not the the right story to tell, right? These were extremely generous, productive people who did a lot for their community. So so you you mentioned the literacy rates in the 1910s, 1920s. um, And would you argue that during Jim Crow, like all the the upheavals – it, it, I mean, in Catholic social teaching, there's this concept of uh, subsidiarity yeah. that we talk a lot about at, at Acton and, and in other venues. Um, it's those that are closest to a problem or an issue are best able to handle and engage it at the local level. And the further concentric circles you get away from the actual topic at hand, the least likely it is to be able to have a, a solution that actually doesn't have deleterious or you know strong un- unintended consequences. So what in, in that from 1920s on, I mean, is that – a lot of the deterioration, is that from the great society? I mean, are we still seeing consequences from some of the the financial and and, and nationalized issues that were put down um, from top down? I mean, where does that 
emerge? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, okay, first we have to talk about the hubris of the progressive planners Hmm. Um, because the progressives at the turn of the century are really buying into the man of system, you know, Adam Smith's man of system kind of attitude. And so they're doing things like establishing the Federal Housing Administration's redlining program. They're doing things like slum clearance, where they're just wiping out whole neighborhoods. They're doing things like the Federal Highway Project, where they're dividing white and black neighborhoods and eminent domaining, you know, the heck out of these black uh, neighborhoods, as well as Latino out west, right? Let's not forget that as, as well. That does such an incredible amount of damage because it takes communities that are gaining some momentum and it scatters them to the four winds. This is so damaging. But then when it comes to the sort of debate we have over the great society, the way that I deal with this in the book is I say, you know, actually, everybody's kind of right. And here's what I mean, and and a little bit wrong, too. Uh, Here's what I mean. You know, William Julius Wilson wants to say it's all about unemployment. And that's why, you know, marriage rates go down among among the black family. Um, conservatives want to say it's all about welfare. Um, and that's why the rates go down. Um, but that can't explain it because a whole bunch of white people are on welfare and their rates didn't go down as fast. Um, what I try to say is there's actually a trifecta going on here. You've got serious unemployment truly because the unions wouldn't let black people in. And then the minute they finally got talked into letting black people in, they had pushed the wages up so high that everybody was either automating or offshoring, right? right? It happened way faster than it – it was going to happen, but it happened way faster than it needed to. So the moment that black men could actually get a manufacturing job, the manufacturing jobs were gone. That by itself doesn't explain it because in the Depression, you had marriage delayed, but marriage rates did not go down. People just waited a little bit and still got married. So that doesn't explain it. But if you pair it with the bad incentives that you see in the great society with the undermining of fatherhood, and then you add in the piece nobody ever talks about, which is the contraception shock, right? And so the contraception shock totally changes the way that men and women relate to one another. That ends up playing out among all of us eventually. But the point is, is that black people are in a vulnerable position, so it hits them first and hardest, right? And now we see white people are at a 30 percent out of wedlock birth rate, which is 5 percent higher than the one that was calling – than the percentage that was causing Daniel Patrick Moynihan to panic in the mid-60s about the black community. And the Latinos are at 50 percent. So, you know, we're – nobody's towing the line here except maybe the Asians, okay? (laughs) You know, no one's towing the line. It's just that it takes longer to work its way through the society and the most vulnerable group gets hit first. One of the other great things about your book is the interdisciplinary nature of it because the idea of social Darwinism, right, and and all of the the different thoughts on whether it's eugenics or just, um, like you said, managerially – mastering the pieces from the national level. Um, Talk about zoning a little bit. I mean, you look at a map of – I have a very good friend in Detroit and uh, a year or so ago, he sent me a picture of downtown Detroit pre the interstate and then after the interstate and showed the different neighborhoods and how it was bisected and how it just literally – I mean, just created a different city Yes, with, with, with the interstate systems running through. And so tell me a little bit. I mean, I know there's house zoning. You know, there's all the kinds of interstate systems that have, that have happened. But how has zoning contributed to this? Yeah, this is major because what happens is, OK, at first people try to do actual racial zoning. It's actually very early that the Supreme Court knocks this down. You can't do this. Um, I think it might even be in the 19-teens that the Supreme Court deals with that. But all people had to do was switched to zoning for single family versus multifamily or high density housing. And then that way you can say, oh, well, this is our residential area and this is our industrial area or whatever. But really what you're doing is you're keeping anyone who can't afford a single family dwelling out, which ends up being many times black people, right? So they use sort of class warfare in order to do the racial warfare, if you want to look at it that way. And I think the whole relationship between race and class is really complicated in the history of America. They're very much tied up together. And what's stupid about it is now you see everybody trying to undo all of this. They're trying to pull the highways out of the cities and make them walkable. They're trying to build mixed-use spaces, Mm -hmm. right? Well, guess what we had in the 20s? Mixed-use spaces. But we zoned the heck out of everything. And so one of the things I really kind of go off on in the book is nimbyism and nimbyism, right? Right. 
So, yeah, the no in my backyard, not in my backyard. You know, there's there's sort of joke things I've seen on social media where you see, you know, we love everyone signs right next to no to the new apartment building. And it's like, yeah, if you love everyone, you need to let them live in the apartment building in your neighborhood because lower income people need to be able to live near their jobs. OK, and you need some high density housing. Uh, for those people. And so we need to get more into a yes in my backyard attitude. And it's so hypocritical. You go to a place like Portland, Oregon, and everybody's Mr. and Mrs. Social Justice, but it is so expensive to live there. You couldn't right. possibly be a poor person in Portland and, ev- and everyone's white. Yeah. <laughs> you know? We lived in, uh, uh, earlier in my career, I lived in South Orange County, California. There you go. And, and uh, you want to talk <laughs> about master planned communities and the people that actually worked in the county largely lived uh, 100 miles away. It, well, actually, not even that. It took them two and a half hours to get there, but it was only 30 miles away oh. out in Corona and the Because of the Empire. terrible traffic. And they just got to drive because yeah. they can't afford that that pace. And so it, zoning, a lot of people, it, it, that's, it's not a very, uh, if you will, sexy topic. Right. <laughs> but, it, but it is, if you look through the history, the redlining of real estate and the idea of, uh, like you said, even just high density housing, the ability to have people um, housed like you said, in proximity to their jobs right. it, where they can create meaningful community. Um, and, and another part, you know, that that community piece um, was really interesting to me when you said um, some of your own experience or the people you've, you've rubbed shoulders with who are trying to do this. Um, you've seen it both personally in St. Louis, but then you've met a lot of people who are doing this in other places like Atlanta. And to tell me about some of the, the work that's going on now to try to – for the lack of a better term, heal some of the divide or, or to, to um, repair yeah. some of this. Yeah, I think if there's – of all the five solutions that we discuss in the book, the one I'm most passionate about is neighborhood stabilization. Um, the others are all sort of necessary, get out of people's way kind of policy changes. But neighborhood stabilization is so important because think about all the layers we just discussed, the slum clearance, the redlining, the union exclusion, the um, welfare state, right? And you're just slamming these people over and over and over again, and they're ghettoized. So they're, they're becoming literally isolated in a ghettoized area of the city. And I'm using that term sort of like in its true meaning, mm-hmm. right? Which right. is that you're sort of fenced off. You're not allowed to live anywhere else. And really for many, many decades, they weren't. Right. And so it's so dysfunctional and so destabilized that I really get very frustrated with both sides of the conversation on this, because I think conservatives can fall off the horse on the side of, you know, well, people should just get a job and get married and do the right thing. And it's like, guess what? If you're not part of a community where there's employment networks and you've never been to a wedding in your life, which is true of many of these kids, it's never going to occur to you to do any of those things, right? Because actually human beings flourish in a community, okay? And so that's not realistic. And then on the other side, you have these progressive free freedom dreamers like Angela Davis. I mean, she's worse than progressive, I guess, but, you know, where it's just ridiculous. They think that if you have the right mix of government programs, you'll be able to have a policeless society or something. I mean, come on, right? It's just absolute magical thinking. The thing about neighborhood stabilization, it is so grounded in reality. And the reality is, if you're going to really change people's lives and help them to emerge from the negative patterns and emerge from poverty, You don't need to send them out for another program. You can't do something that's nationwide or even statewide. You can't even do something that's citywide. You need to go down to the level of the block, block by block, and you need to live there. There needs to be someone with personal presence in the neighborhood, and you need to stay there for eight to 10 years. You need to stay there when your car gets stolen. You need to stay there when there's a murder on the corner. This takes love, right? This takes love, which is why Christians have led the way. The famous books are Brian Fickert, When Helping Hurts, Robert Lupton, Toxic Charity. These guys are all Christians, right? And they're trying to get churches to change their philanthropic model, quit it with the Christmas shoe boxes, all right? It's like, I get it, you're well-intentioned, but nobody's going to emerge from poverty because of your Christmas shoe box. What it will do is shame a dad to give that, you know, to give to give their kid something. Yeah, absolutely. So don't do that. Make your Christmas store. Let the dad come to the store and at a discounted rate buy something, wrap it himself and give it to his child because that's dignifying. Yeah. Right? And so I think being realistic about human nature, hey, if we're going to get people jobs, we actually need to walk through life with them to fill out the application and know what to do when their manager's a jerk. People don't know how to do that necessarily if they haven't been around it. And so you have to live with people and walk through life with them. Yeah, and it, it's it's uh... 
you know, I forget who I first heard it from, but this idea of drive-by charity or, you know, a lot of people are, are built in this write a check or this, uh, yeah. and, and to quote uh, the pastor Eugene Peterson in, in a different context, but it this seems like it takes a long obedience in the same direction. That's it. Like, Great like a, phrase. a really long-term view and, and, and churches, what, you know, you said the, the strength of the black church um, historically has, has helped create these. Um, but I think the white church can, can do better, like you said, at creating pathways um, for opportunities. I mean, in, in the inner city churches, they culturally try to come in and bring a certain kind of cultural um, ideal, I guess, and it, it, you see, you see, church after church or church plant after church plant fail, yeah, be, because they don't take into account some of this subsidiarity or these localized needs um, for the long term. What? So you tell me a little bit about the organization you're a part of in St. Louis. Yeah, so Love the Lou, L O U for St. Louis, yeah. right? Love the org. If you want to look it up, I'm on the board there. And I'm so passionate about it. And the reason I am is because you can see it with your own eyes. You know, you can drive down to Enright Boulevard, which is one of the toughest areas of town in North City of St. Louis, and you can see the community gardens, the rebuilt homes, uh, I mean, refurbished, right? They didn't tear down, but refurbished. And you, once you start meeting the kids, you're meeting kids who really would have been on a terrible road in terms of drugs, drug dealing, prison, et cetera, um, out of wedlock pregnancy and so forth. And the only reason they're not is because there was an alternative presented to them that was in their neighborhood, that they could literally walk down the street on a Saturday morning and see a bunch of people building a community garden. And if they wanted to be a part of it, they would be paid and they could move up the ladder and become a garden leader and then go to small machines, right? And you get these kids when they're 13, 14 years old, and they're thinking, I've watched my older brother or cousin go to prison. I've watched them get gunned down. I don't want to go down that road. That's just the only road I know, right? And what we've seen is that 95% of the kids who participate in Love the Lou stay with it. They graduate high school and they get jobs or go to college. It's absolutely incredible. And it's changing the whole neighborhood. Now they're moving on to the second neighborhood because it's been about 10 years because that's as long as it takes. You've got to spend years just gaining the trust of the neighbors, yeah. right, as an outsider. So it does take a long-term perspective. But can I just put that in perspective for a moment? Please. How many decades are we going to spend going after these – this sort of progressive mindset push-button solution – where experts come up with all kinds of cockamamie ideas that they think they're going to put into place. It makes things worse. We've wasted decades doing that. If you had enough people and churches dedicated to this block-by-block -block model, the neighborhood stabilization model, it wouldn't actually have to take that long. If every block takes 10 years and everybody went to everybody blo everybody's block, you could have all the blocks in 10 years. It's just that we have this other mindset that we have to break out of. So largely, I mean, it, it it's simple but not easy. Yes. I mean, we sometimes we hyper we, – we make things much more complicated than they have to be. I mean, the idea of um, civil associations isn't new, right? You didn't invent this. No. <laughs> um, and and the, the, the concept of civil associations, strong family networks, stable jobs. I mean, that, that there's some core principles to what it means to be um, – uh, what – uh, one economist called the success sequence, yeah, and and, and helping people see um, that the, these cycles can be broken. I, but, I think, but the flip is that you can't just start a jobs program. Right? Exactly, that's what fails because no one's there to walk them through getting a car, learning how to drive, getting insurance. Da 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 da. Right, yeah. that's the that's where you have to live with people. And be walking through life. And so it's such a mindset change for churches. And that's why the Chalmers Center helps churches mm -hmm. to flip their model. And you guys have your Poverty Core series mm -hmm. uh, for churches as well. And so, uh, you know, that's it's just so important that we say to ourselves, you know what, if what we're doing isn't working, we need to stop. Right. We just need to stop. And do something else. Yeah, like the sunk cost fallacy. We, we, some people put so much money into something. And it's, right, and it's they hard. just keep going. Keep going. <laughs> just keep chasing I will it. say this, which is don't be intimidated by the whole like living in the neighborhood thing. We're not asking every person who cares to move to the neighborhood. That's going to be a special calling. You at living in the suburbs say you are the resource upon which those uh, persons of peace in the neighborhood call to get all kinds of – 
you know, volunteer groups or funding or mentoring. And a lot of it ties into the faith, work and economics theme because so many and I'm going to I'm going to go out on a limb here and say a lot of men, especially, are sitting in church and nobody in church is talking to them about the way God wants to use their business skills for Mm -hmm. the kingdom of God. And so they're being asked to write a check or be a greeter or something, yeah, exactly. you know, but but what if you said, hey, could you help this inner city entrepreneur figure out their taxes and you've got a tax accountant or could you help this inner city entrepreneur deal with this regulation and get licensed? Right. I mean, now you're saying, hey, guess what? Your skills matter for the kingdom of God, too. And so the benefit goes both ways. And it's multi-generational. I mean, you, you build in these um, the opportunities in your book. You I mean, you talk about such a varied uh, and wide ranging group of, of, of things like education, incarceration. Yeah. I mean, economic. I mean, you, you let, let I already said this, but the, the interdisciplinary nature and the – again, so it is complex. I don't want to make it sound um, – I mean, I, I think it is a little more simple than we make it. But the historical complexities that are overlaid, trying to break people's worldview, if you will, of seeing what success looks like. Yeah. We're so used to large checks from nationalized organizations trying to solve problems and we know that doesn't work. It doesn't work. I mean, it may, may be very, very short-term blips. But we know it, it destroys families. It destroys um, the culture, if you will, in, in a way that isn't talked about. So um, I, I just uh, am absolutely uh, uh, amazed that the, your combination of these topics, really thankful for you and your, and your co-author. Um, and this book comes out in May, correct? That's right. You can pre-order it on Amazon Pre-order it on Amazon. <laughs> I, I really do. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we joke about that, but it, it is really a unique take. Um, on this topic that is that is is needed, and for a lot of like you, you're trying to break down um, tribalism or this bundling topic, like you mentioned earlier. And sometimes conservatives or classical liberals can be really hard on progressives and, and needful in places. But I mean, you're you're an equal opportunity offender. I mean, we, you, oh, you yeah. show places where <laughs> where conservatives and classical liberals, they, they just have missed the boat. They failed. I mean, here's a great example. You know, we always talk about F.A. Hayek, right? Yeah. Such an important classical liberal figure. He's literally laying out the legal infrastructure that you need for a strong commercial society. And he never mentions the fact that black people were excluded. Never. Yeah. That's weird, yeah. right? That's weird. So you had some classical liberals that did the right thing, but you had others that missed the boat yeah. and they weren't sensitive to that. And we can we can be sensitive today. Do, do you think some people are, uh, because of some of the political connotations, they shy away from what we would argue either economic or moral considerations because of the political language or, or sloganeering? Absolutely. So we, we kind of tense up with certain buzzwords, right? And so if you start talking about, you know, black liberation, people are going to, oh, or social justice or something, and everybody gets really upset. And so what they do is instead of thinking, okay, what's true and what's false here, they kind of run in the other direction. And that's why I call it reactionaryism, (laughs) you know? And so they're just kind of going, well, if they're saying this, I'll just say the opposite. No, 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 don't say the opposite. (laughs) Say, okay, of what they're saying, What part is true and what part is false and make the distinctions? Well, Dr. Ferguson, thank you so much for the chance to join us um, on Act in Line podcast. Uh, We'll put a link to the book in the show note. Thank you. So people can see it um, when it it comes out. And uh, thank you for joining us today for your lecture earlier in the Act in Lecture series. That will be in our uh, archive as well. And we look forward to uh, many years of participation with you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Gabriel Zsa Zsa.